All right, so the next one we're going to do is ash. So this ash reload is uh, 9 sixteenths. Let's see. Uh, what was it? It is 5 eighths of an inch, or if you're metric, one and a half inches approximately. And this reload, by the way, which is hollowed out, um, and the base, both, came from the uh, same ash replacement handle for tools from a hardware store, just like this uh, reloader spindle. Okay. Um, so the Janka uh, scale hardness of ash, and I think this is white ash, is just over 1300, maybe 1370 approximately, we'll say. So it's supposed to be maybe a little more uh, harder than oak. So we're going to do that on our walnut reloader torque spindle with our moderated Egyptian bojo method. Now, it's already mated. It's got a notch on the side, literally. And I'm just going to use a little bit of dust in the notch so it's not so high. Now, it'll slide around so it's nailed to the table. I'm going to wear a shoe. Alright. And we're going to get this warmed up. So ash, not as hard as hickory, but maybe a little harder than oak. So using the whole cord, I'm just resting my body weight on the pressure hand brace, which is Osage Orange, by the way. And we just keep going. Give a little bit more speed. We have to make up for that diameter. And I think we have a coal, so let's have a look. Oh yeah, that looks like a coal. White ash from the replacement handle from a hardware store. Base, reload, and coal. Very nice. That was actually quite easy. I have to admit. And there we go. Shall we try another? Let's go. All right, so we're gonna try hickory. Uh, lignum vitae, the official version. Uh, one of the hardest woods in the world. Rates uh, 4,500, 4,500 on the Janka scale. And hickory, uh, this hickory reload here is a drumstick from the music store, which I took down just a little bit. So it's uh, about half an inch in diameter and it is hollowed out. This is uh, hickory from a mole handle. One of the mole handles you saw earlier it still has a label on it here on the side where I ripped it through the table saw. Okay. And as you can see, it's already mated with the notch toward you. All right. And we're going to give this a shot with our Osage Orange pressure hand brace. 
So this one does five wraps around to get the tension just right. Again, no knot and no hole. I'm going to wear a shoe. Hickory, by the way, is uh, rates over 2,000 on the Jonka scale. Actually, we're going to pre-fill that notch a little bit with some dust. So it doesn't have to fall so high. It's a pretty high base. Something like 2,040. Whereas the oak is more or less 1,300. So the, uh, the hickory as a hardness is much harder. See what we got. We have us a coal. Hickory on hickory. And there we go. I give credit to my friend Barry Keegan for showing us the torque spindle method with hardwoods that it can be done. My friend John Haas, who is a uh, kettlebell uh, trainer expert, uh, sent us a, uh, a saying from one of the uh, uh, past movies of the 90s, uh, The Edge. Um, what one man can do, another can do. And uh, so I want to thank Barry Keegan for passing this along. And it is now passed on to you. All right, let's keep going. All right, and welcome to the Epimetheae section of the Egyptian drill. Now it's dark outside now, so you can't see. But in the past scenes uh, of this section, um, you'll notice behind me that there are a whole bunch of branches outside uh, in my back backyard there. Um, we just recently had a pretty good storm here, uh, October 29th, 2011. A uh, big snowstorm came through the, the East Coast um, here in the northern part of New Jersey. And uh, we got here five inches of heavy wet snow and the leaves were still on the trees. So what started happening was um, the snow collected on the trees and started snapping branches. Um, and it did it everywhere across uh, most of northern New Jersey. So there was a lot of power outages. People were out without a power some, some, in some areas for like two weeks. Um, it was very bad. Lines were down, a lot of accidents, and uh, so it caused a real mess. Um, electric company trucks have been out for weeks trying to make all the repairs, and uh, but uh, 
what came down in my yard uh, are uh, some tulip poplar, some Norway maple, an another kind of maple. In my neighbor's yard, uh, he had some tulip poplar come down, his pecan tree, he has an apple tree, um, he has a, a huge lilac bush over there, and a whole bunch of branches just came down from everywhere. Um, he's got some pine trees, some branches came down from that. And uh, so I've been collecting all the branches and I, I put them all in the back for me to just cut up for firewood or to uh, make projects out of, depending on what I find. But I'm going to show you some quick footage of that storm. And it relates to uh, natural law, uh, which is a big part of what we do here because uh, our uh, single natural law theory uh, natural law theory of equilibrium uh, tells us that um, the nature, the universe is moving toward equilibrium. Not necessarily balance. Balance is something human. Uh, where there's balance and imbalance. But equilibrium is just something that the universe is just moving toward. And it doesn't care that humans are in the way. So uh, it doesn't care if you live or die Things like that but it's up to humans to find balance from imbalance and uh, so I'll show you a little bit of footage from the storm some of the branches that came down that I collected and uh, just to keep that in mind um, especially because this is uh, has to do with friction fire imagine the conditions you would be under if you had to make a fire at that point in time like in a storm or something like that. So uh, just to show you that, keep that in the front of your mind because to keep perspective, uh, our ancestors, a lot of them died and because of those deaths, a lot of these methods and techniques came to be. So uh, we remember our ancestors and the struggles and the adversities and the hardships that they went through. Um, keep that perspective while we do those things. And uh, there's still some of that ahead for us too. Because <clears throat> humanity hasn't gotten rid of those, those problems yet. Not that we ever will. But uh, so we, we keep trudging along. Alright, here's some footage for that. And we're going to move on to our next section the crutch drop. All right. So today is Saturday. October 29th, 2011 in New Jersey, and it is snowing. It's so weird. Isn't it? Snowing on October 29th. Believe it. So, so this is an example of natural law. Nature doesn't care <laughs> if you live or die, whatever is going on. Tsunamis, earthquakes, snowing in October. You are fully responsible for balancing everything in your life toward life and living. All right, let's keep going. And uh, my neighbor has some tulip poplar in his front yard and uh, just as I was standing outside, some limbs came down because of the snow. So I don't know if you can see the track marks. Uh, I got rid of the branches for them. And uh, I'm going to do something with the branches. It's tulip poplar. And then as I was out here, he also has a pecan tree. I don't know if you can see. But a limb came down. I heard the crack, and there it is. A down limb. 
Well, here's pecan tree. And then back here, a couple seconds later, there's a maple tree. In fact, there it is. I'll zoom in on it. There's a, uh, where is it? There's another limb that's down from the snow. All within five minutes of each other. Heard the crack. So again, Joe Lau's single natural law theory of equilibrium. Oh, there goes another one. You heard it and you saw it. There you go. Joe Lau's single natural law theory of equilibrium. Nature does not care whether you live or die. Laws of nature have no pity. So, you have to do everything you can to stay in balance for your life and for living. So, uh, as my saying goes, uh, life and living may very well be the standard by which all things be measured, especially ethics, morals and ethics as a primary value. All right, let's keep going. More branches. More branches off my neighbor's tulip poplar tree. You can hear cracking all around me from neighbor's yards of branches coming down. And two more came down in my backyard. So, October 29th, 2011. Three inches of snow already. All right, and welcome to our next variation of the bow drill. And it is called the crutch drill. And uh, it gets that name from its look where uh, it's kind of a, it's mostly known for a standing position uh, where there's a, a really, really long spindle like this one. It can be done uh, sitting, kneeling, or standing. Standing is probably preferred. Um, and this is really my most favorite one for teaching children because it's, for them it's the most stable. Uh, for children it's kind of hard to get into the bow drill, Egyptian drill kind of position. Uh, the kneeling with trying to uh, keep it stable up against the leg. But with the crutch drill they're able to stand up and hold the long spindle under a, a large brace, which we call a pressure arm brace. And it looks like they're leaning on a crutch. You know, it's very, in a way, it's almost very tiny Tim-like. So, uh, but they're able to get uh, fires going with this uh, very well. And uh, so it's one of my favorites to teach the kids with because they can get it right away. Um, show you a couple of pictures of those of me showing a, a scout troop back in a day been showing this for a long long time uh, so our next one after this is going to be the giant drill 
which is a really large bow drill and uh, you're lucky to do it actually with just one person but of course we're trying to do everything as one person that you're the only one doing it so we might call the crutch drill a uh, medium size drill axis method or uh, a person size we'll say because you always try to create the drills all of the methods actually uh, to the size of the person they kind of have to be rather personal in that way um, I mentioned uh, way back that I had sent a video of me showing the crutch drill to that guy named Storm who passed away hopefully you're uh, you've read his uh, list of materials that you could use uh, on the West Coast and uh, hope that's hope that's helpful so uh, yeah I sent him a video of of this method of this technique many many years ago and uh, I hope it did well for him well so this is the only the only new method I ever learned at the school that I used to work at. Everything else I learned uh, beginning uh, somewhere else. But this is the only new method I ever learned there. So uh, the crutch drill is a uh, bipolar method, which means uh, it's not free like the hand drill or the pump drill, which will be following this method and it requires a unilateral force so this also uses uh, a bow whether you do a string around once like a bow drill or you string around a couple times like an Egyptian drill uh, I'll show you those anyway but uh, it requires a bow and it is a unilateral force so as I'll mention in our next segment of the uh, science of the basic form your spindle must be very strong and solid like the Egyptian drill um, so it doesn't takeyori on you so it doesn't break in the middle and again the, the longer the spindle the more of a chance of it breaking so it has to be a really solid solid spindle all right so uh, that's our Promethei section segment and uh, let's get on to science of the basic form of the crutch drill All right, so welcome to Science of the Basic Form of the Crutch Drill. And uh, our equation goes from right to left. So we're studying our devices so we get to know them. We go from structure to function, okay? So we've gone over the uh, pressure mouth brace, pressure hand brace. Now we have a new one. We have the pressure arm brace. And how this works is, it's a long version of like a hand brace, okay? And it fits under the armpit, okay? And held out. And here you kind of lean on it. So, uh, again with that other factor that I had talked about earlier about uh, some of the braces being round. You can't really tell if it's level or not. So again, that still applies to these. All right, I kind of like them flat on some level. So here uh, I have a old hickory mall handle. All right, that it is it is oval, however. So to me, in a way, that's that's flat. It has uh, it has the flared sides, and it's flat on the top, and it's flat on the bottom. So when I'm holding it, at least with my hand out here I can know if it's uh, going off center or not okay so to me this is somewhat flat and because it's rounded off it makes it comfortable for it to sit under your your armpit like this because if it was all square like your base well those sharp edges were kind of like cut in and just kind of be uncomfortable so uh, this one is a hickory mole handle, and you notice that the the hole, the uh, the brace end socket, is not directly in the middle. Okay, it's 
um, one side is going to be closer to your armpit. So that's where the hole goes near. Much like how the hole in your pressure hand brace is centered more toward your palm, uh, the wrist area of your palm, the socket should be set more back toward your armpit because uh, the farther out, the farther out away from your body, the more you have to push down with your arm. Well, you don't want to do that. With the crutch drill, you're leaning your body weight on there, so it has to be closer to your body. The socket has to be closer to your body from when you're leaning on it. Now, the first technique we're going to do of this method is we're going to do the sitting position. Then we're going to do kneeling position and then standing position. The standing position is probably the most common. Um, kids will prefer either kneeling or standing. A lot of times standing because then they feel more stable. So our base is uh, Atlantic White Cedar, okay? It's already mated with a notch on the side. Our spindle is a broomstick handle. Um, I believe it's oak. Poor quality oak. Uh, right. And it is uh, drilled in and quartered. And the reload uh, is yucca held in with a hose clamp, okay, as you can see. Now the thing about these spindles, okay, they must be absolutely straight, okay, that, that principle still applies, and like the Egyptian drill, it must be very strong and solid, okay, it can't bust in the middle, because again we have this unilateral force pushing in the middle, and here too, your reload must be solidly set in there because that would be a weak link in the chain, right? From the force going back and forth. It can't be weak down here where this is inserted. That's got to be really solid as well, all right? Now your bow should be a solid bow. Um, you could do it either the bow drill method way of it going around once, but the Egyptian way of doing it multiple times around is preferred. And in this instance, we're just going to keep doing my moderated one that's in between. So we're just going to do a couple wraps around without doing a clove hitch or drilling a hole through the spindle, which I think just weakens the spindle. All right. So I'm going to do the sitting position. Now, if you remember back uh, when we did uh, the sitting kneeling positions, the one that I prefer in sitting is uh, the fudoza, or the immovable seat in Japanese. So I'm going to get into that position and hold the base that way and drill that way and show you that. So starting from the top, okay, again we put the spindle to the cord after we get our triangle, all right. Again the the handle part of the bow is on my right side because I'm right-handed. So that all that still applies. But we're going to go a little bit more toward the tip, toward the brace end. And we're going to go around this way. All right. Now the thing is, is that you can't really wind this if this is really tall around the middle. So you have to do it toward the top. And then you have to when you get near the tension, slide everything down to about the first one-third, maybe, okay, until the tension is just right. As you can see, the bow is still on an angle, okay, just like we did with our Egyptian drill. Right. I'm going to get my Fudoza position. I sit on my right ankle, sitting on my right ankle. My left leg comes across and the sole of my left foot sit, um, rests up against the sh shin of my right leg. In this instance, the base is going to be just under the shin.
over my left leg. And as I lean forward, that puts pressure on the base to hold that in place. Okay? And the base should be lined up where it's underneath my armpit. Okay? So that's going to sit there. Here's our pressure arm brace, okay? Now, the brace end goes in the socket, and it goes near or un just under the armpit, okay? And I'm just gonna lean a little bit on it, okay? And just start to get that warmed up. You can see it's smoking all right. Now I could bear down all my body weight on this. But I'm really just gonna do a little bit. And there we go. It's that easy. Now that was yucca on cedar, so we know that that's easy. But the crutch drill is really designed to do harder woods as well, just like the Egyptian drill. Now you can really be uh, very stable with this method, and you can really get a lot of pressure on it because you're really literally putting your whole body weight on the spindle. Okay. So that's our first one kneeling. That's really not a very common one. I mean, uh, our first one sitting. Um, the most common is kneeling or standing. And most of these you're going to see me standing. All right, so that's the first one. All right, let's do kneeling. So we're going to do a demonstration of the kneeling technique. Um, first I'm going to show you a spindle that uh, is not uh, good for, uh, for this method. Um, here I have a rather thin um, stalk of bamboo for a spindle, but I want you to see what happens when we try this method with this spindle. So it's already bound around, okay? Now, my pressure arm brace here is a banister for a stairway, as you can see, all right? And uh, it's got a lot of good weight on it, which kind of helps a lot. Again, the the socket is, is not exactly in the middle, but it's set back a little bit. And uh, you may not be able to see me all the way up here, but I want you to look at the spindle when I bow. You can see it bend. See, with the unilateral force, it bends with each direction that I go in. So that's no good. All right, we need something that's really solid and is going to maintain its axis. So we're going to not use that. That does not qualify. All right. Here I have a uh, pine uh, closet dowel that you would, in your closet, uh, you hang your clothes on. Okay. And uh, these come in pretty long, uh, long sections. So you cut them down to the size that you need. This one is the size for, for me for kneeling, all right? And uh, it's pretty wide as a diameter. Let me see here. It's about one and a quarter inch in diameter as a pine dowel, okay? Now, it's a box cut notch for the um, reload, okay? So you 
can see with a hose clamp. Now I have this reload here that's uh, on its last legs. It's really short. Okay, as you can see, it's a hollowed a little bit. It's Atlantic white cedar. It's a box cut. Okay, and that'll fit right in there. Second to adjust that. Okay. Tighten that up. All right. So there's our what's left of our reload. It's on its last legs. Got to need a new one soon. The base is Atlantic White Cedar. As you can see, this has been used quite a bit. All right. We're going to do this one here. It's already been mated. We have our. Uh, Coal catcher down there. We haven't used that in a while. So we touch the spindle to the string near the brace end, okay, because you can't string it from the middle. We wrap it around a couple times, check the tension. So we got to do one more. So this will wrap around three times for the tension that we want. And we work it down a little bit, down the spindle, keep the string together. Okay, get the tension right. Now the kneeling position I'm going to do is the Shiko type that you saw earlier, where I'm up on my toes. You can see my back leg, I'm up on my toes, on my knee, and this leg is forward. Okay. And this is going to sit right under my armpit, as you can see. All right. And we get this warmed up. As you can see it's smoking already. This is a really good technique for children because they're very stable. It's easier for them to do. I didn't fill the notch, so I'm going to keep going. Let me lower the string. The string is too high. Okay. Very easy technique. All right. Perfect coal. Perfect brown dust. All right. And you can modify your kneeling position any way that you have to but as long as it's stable and works for you, all right? Let's do the standing position. All right, so we're gonna do our standing form here in Science of the Basic Form. We're doing our scales, okay? Now the standing one, in my opinion, is uh, a very stable position. Uh, the kids really like it uh, because they're they're very stable. They can stand up and do it. All right. Um, it allows you to, to apply the most pressure because you could literally just bend your knees and just rest your weight on it. So uh, it allows you to do a couple things. Not just add more pressure, but you're also able to deal with um, harder density, all right, and more surface area. 
as well if those are issues. Like if you run into woods where you can't really get this carved down as small as you want it to be, well, that, that really shouldn't be a problem if you're making something like this. But um, If you have a lower density wood, then you can use more surface area, okay? Now, the, basically a general rule for our principles would be uh, the harder the wood, the less surface area you want. Obviously, you want to reduce that. And uh, that also includes um, hollowing out your dead space center. Okay, you really want to do that. It's really not necessary to have it in there. It interferes with uh, your ability to make fire. It really doesn't need to be there, so get rid of it, really. Especially if life is on the line, you know, just, just do it. The other thing about the standing position is that you have a lot of space, our uh, principal space. So when you get into this wide stance and it looks like you're playing the cello, which I'm going to show you, sometimes the chord can really ride up and down, but you have all that space to really allow it to do that. Okay. Sometimes it'll ride up, you need to stop, push it back down again, but uh, that can happen a lot with your other drills as well, uh, your bow drill. But here, a lot of times your, your arm is swinging back and forth so much that it, uh, it sends the cord riding either up or down, usually up the spindle. So you have to really try to keep it level, just like you're kind of playing the cello, as I call it. So uh, your pressure arm brace, uh, the one we're gonna use right now, again is the uh, pine banister okay and uh, how you would make one of these uh, primitively is you get yourself a sapling and you split it in half if you can do that you don't I mean if you were desperate and it was getting down on the wire and you didn't really have much choice I guess you could just cut the sapling and leave it whole but then again it's round and uh, that allows for rolling so if you if you're gonna make one of these anyway you're gonna be taking the time to make one so uh, primitively you may want to just grab a sapling and actually just split it in half like as if you were doing bow staves or something like when you're making a bow um, your spindle oh and your your pressure arm brace should be like a bow almost where it's, it's about arm's length okay that's really comfortable because this is going to go under your armpit you're going to kind of bend your elbow off the side and just kind of lean on it, just like this, okay? Your hand, I like the um, overhand grip where I reach down and my fingers can tell that it's flat, okay? Some people will hold it with an underhand grip and kind of choke up on it. That's okay. Whatever you find that's comfortable and stable it is good, okay? This is just how I do it. But you'll make your own variations and your own uh, adjustments and modifications as you go. Uh, so your spindle will be probably, in, in a primitive situation, a good straight sapling that you'll take down, you'll take the bark off, okay? When you select it, you have to make sure that it's really, really straight. Okay, you want its axis to be really, really straight on top of everything. Um, obviously, if you have a sapling, the grain is going to be going straight down. You shouldn't have to worry about run out, things like that. And it should be very solid, okay? It shouldn't have any flex, and it shouldn't be weak, okay? It should not uh, have uh, take ori on you at all. It should not break in the mill, okay? It should be very strong. It should be very solid. So, um, if you need to buy one, just go to the hardware store. You could buy a pine dowel like this one. Um, and I recommend, okay, that you get one that's over an inch in diameter. Now here I have an oak one, uh, an oak dowel, and it is one inch in diameter. But here's what I'm gonna tell you. When you're doing a standing um, crush drill, you really want it to be uh, like a torque drill. You're putting a lot of pressure on this and the thinner the diameter the less torque you're going to have. And actually you're going to pretty much struggle with it if it's about an inch and if you're kind of an adult. Um, a child will probably, it'll, 
a standing child would probably be around here, and this would probably be a good size for them to do the one inch. But for an adult, I recommend it be like maybe uh, an inch and an eighth, an inch and a quarter, something like that. I would recommend an inch and a quarter, really, for good torque. And uh, you're probably obviously going to make it a reloader spindle because uh, you don't really want your spindle to actually shrink down unless you're doing an experiment and you're going to go from standing to kneeling to sitting and you want your spindle to shrink down like that. But that's okay too. I mean, training is training. Uh, so your pressure arm brace. Uh, you can purchase in in the hardware store something a little smaller than a two by four. I think you could find woods that are a little smaller than that. The banister looks is uh, pretty good. It's already rounded. It's pretty solid. Um, but each store is going to be different, and you're going to have different things to select from. Okay, a hardwood is always going to be better. Um, again, you could select not not just oak, but ash and hickory uh, tool handles and they're going to be thicker than one inch uh, which I would really recommend okay so I would recommend those thick ones of ash and hickory if you're just going to go grab one if you're not going to select one from from nature all right now uh, so we're still in our pad pie kind of thing problem assess diagnose plan uh, implement and evaluate but what I don't really go, well, I kind of skim over plan. Plan has a lot of preparation involved with it. And when you see me do stuff here on the video, I've already done most of my preparations. In fact, preparations are like 95% of getting a fire going. So it's kind of like a cooking show where they're, you know, they prepare everything, and um, which you really wouldn't see, you know, and then they put that underneath. They don't really let it cook. They pull out one that's already cooked, kind of thing. Well, uh, I'm kind of pulling out something that's kind of already cooked. Sometimes you don't see me do all the preparations that that um, that I need to do. You see the finished product. Like you didn't see me um, fit and measure the reload. You didn't see me measure for the the height of the spindle. Um, all those little things. You know the mating process making sure the cord is the right tension. All, there's like, uh, you know, dozens of different things you need to do and go over. And you're just seeing me, you know, s stand up and with these things and, and uh, just do the form, the method, the technique. But the planning stage is, is a big thing. It's 95%. Just having your cuts just right, having everything straight, Balancing all your principles before you start to do your technique, your method. Okay, you have everything ready. You have your tinder bundle ready. If you're going to go the whole nine yards, you have your your TP fire ready. You have your coal catcher. You have a coal pick or a knife or something to get the coal out of there. All of those things. All of those things are are ready to go, where you don't have to. Uh, think or rush or get something last minute. Don't get your coal and then run around and grab something. You should have everything you need right there and then to get this done. All right. So uh, measurements, when you're measuring, or let's say we're measuring for sitting. Get that backwards. So I'm in my Fudoza, okay? Now, if I was measuring for my sitting one, okay, I'd get in my sitting position, and I would take my uh, the spindle that uh, I'm going to measure, okay, and I get my pressure arm brace, and I get that right at that height where it's sitting perpendicular evenly under my, uh, just in front of my armpit. Okay, I can look right at it. Okay, it's right here in front of me. It's not under my armpit. It's right in front of my armpit. Okay, close to my body where I can put my weight on it. 
and I can eyeball it. I can eyeball it almost straight down to make sure my axis is straight. Okay. Now, once I have this measurement, I have to take off like two inches for the board, for the base, and the reload, at least. Okay. Now you can always take off, but you can't put it back on. Okay. So you have to uh, measure twice, cut once. All right. Same with kneeling. So we're a little higher. Okay. So we measure our spindle. We get our pressure arm brace. We get that all set up. Okay. You can do it this way, in Kiza, where we're on our heels. Okay. We're up on our toes. Or we could do it in the Shiko method, which you saw before. Get that measurement, and then take off at least two inches for the base and for the reload. And then when you put your reload and your base on, you measure again. Okay, to make sure that everything's going to be just right. Okay. Especially if you're doing demos for people and stuff like that. Uh, all of this should be done before people see everything. Okay. Although in this teaching method, it's good that you see mistakes and things that I need to go over. Because you'll be passing it along too someday, hopefully. Alright. Uh, so cording your bow. Now you saw the uh, my moderated method. But you can also, like I said, you can use the this regular bow drill way of it wraps around once. And how you do that, okay, is you take your bow, okay, and the handle's on my right side because I'm right-handed, okay, and I'll take the spindle, maybe I'll do it this way, I'll take the spindle and I'll put it inside, see that? I'll go in the front of the bow and put it inside. Now, I'm going to grab the spindle and hold the bow and I'm going to bring it together like that. Okay? And that's strung around once. And if you're going to do the moderated method, Touch your spindle go this way a bit, to your cord. Okay. Now, where the tip is, where the tip of the bow is, you start to wrap up toward the top. Work that down and keep wrapping up toward the top, the tip of the bow. Okay. And get it that way. toward the top until you get the tension just right that you want okay now and remember to you're gonna have to allow for a ride that's just gonna happen all right um, all right, so let's just go on. Let me show you the oak one first. Now this oak one, this oak dowel is one inch. Um, I don't prefer a one inch for a standing crutch drill because to me there's not enough torque. It's a little, it doesn't feel right. And if you try, you may see the same thing. Now this is a scarf cut, as you can see with the oak. This is lumber pine. When I mean lumber pine, I mean like a piece of lumber that you just get at the hardware store, right? So the reload, now see this reload too? This reload is very high and actually that's not good because the weak point is closer to the center of the spindle and we don't want that. We want any weak point to be very much near the end at the base end of the spindle okay 
So that can make it a little bit more unstable. So you have to be very careful with that. This is held in place with two hose clamps, as you can see. My favorite cut, though, for a crush drill though, is a box cut, which I'll show you with the other one. Now, uh, we're just going to go ahead and do the oak one for you. Throw down my coal catcher I haven't done in a while. So we're going to, if you can watch, I got my handle on the right side, because I'm right handed. Now the spindle goes in the front and in, and I take the spindle, put the bow under my arm, and string it, and then grab the bow, okay? One more time. Goes in front, okay? Hold the spindle, put the bow under the arm, and crank it down. Okay. Now my reload is a little off too as well. We get in our wide stance. Okay. We're gonna get this warmed up. See how wobbly it is? The reload is actually a little long. Now, because this bow cord only goes one time around, if I press really hard on the spindle, the cord actually just spins. You see that? You lose, you lose the, the binding, the friction of the cord that makes the spindle turn. Which is why, for this method, you really want to go with either the Egyptian cording method or my moderated one, which is what we're going to do. So we're going to wrap up toward the top. Up. Up. So this will be a, like a real Egyptian method because it's wrapped around so many times. Loosen the tension, slide it down a little bit. Okay. That looks that's gonna bind really well. Okay. Put your arm brace. We're gonna warm this up again. Now this is the oak dowel with the pine reload on a pine base. Not enough torque, in my opinion. Really not enough. Now you can see it's smoking. Again, use the whole bow. Play that cello. Let's see how we did. Looks like we did all right. So you have everything ready. We have a nice big coal. 
the dust is like perfect. It's like a fluffy, fluffy brown. But that one didn't look so stable, right? So I'll tell you what. Let's do the one with more torque so you see the difference. So we're going to do the pine dowel, which is an inch and a quarter, Atlantic white cedar uh, reload, which is also an inch and a quarter, but it's a little hollow. Okay. Now my base, that looks unusual, right? It's a double notch. It's already somewhat mated, okay? And as you can see, it's, it's pretty high, it's a high base. So, I'm thinking maybe of filling that notch a little bit. You know, I'm just gonna go, just gonna go. So we're gonna do a double notch, see if we can get a double coal. We have to string our spindle. Okay. Again, we place the spindle to the cord and we wrap up toward the tip of the bow. It's a good tension on there. Okay. That down a little bit. That's a little high. Your preparations, your adjustments, done. All right. Let's go this way. Okay, get this warmed up. It's already spoken. See how we did. Well, we have a notch on one side. I'm sure if I kept going, I could get the notch on the other side. You can see I was really close with the other one, but I'm running out of energy. <laughs> now that one looked a little bit more stable, right? Because I had more torque. The spindle was a, a greater diameter. <clears throat> All right, so we're gonna move on to art of the variation. You're gonna see some wild stuff. So we're gonna start jazzing, playing around a little bit, get some weird stuff. See some different heights, some other different positions. Uh, 
and that's it. We're just going to play. And then you're going to see my kid do the crutch drill to show that it can be done. All right? Let's keep going.